Oh, we about to really talk spoilers. What is up, Flick fans, and welcome back to my channel. I uh, have to admit to you guys, I had a very special spoiler discussion with my cousin Joseph while we were in Orlando, but something happened to the video. Don't know what, don't know how I lost it, but it's gone along with a few other things I was working on. But you know what? When something like that happens, you have to push through and just do it all again. And since I'm back in my hometown, we are talking Spider-Man Far From Home, full spoilers today. We're going to dive in deep to everything that happened. This is actually a movie that I didn't expect to have massive spoilers talking about the future of the MCU. I knew there would be something in their post credits, but really the entire movie is full of just spoilers. So if you haven't watched the movie, clearly you don't want to watch this video. If you have watched the movie, stick around and we're going to talk about all of these things. I need you guys in the comments down below. What was your favorite spoiler filled moment? This is your section, your place and space to talk about Spider-Man Far From Home and let's dive right into it. But I don't want to start at the beginning of the movie because there are two major events that happen after this film ends. The post credits, the things that everyone has been talking about, two of the biggest post credit scenes of all time in the MCU. And I feel like every time these Twitter reactions or these reviews come out, it's always, oh my gosh, it's the best post credit scene ever. And I always watch the movies, I'm like, yeah, it was good. But it was nothing beyond good. It doesn't match up to that first time Nick Fury shows up at the end of Iron Man. But then you get into Spider-Man Far From Home. The first post credit scene, I look at this as the end of the movie. This scene is integral. So if you know anyone or see anyone at your theater that's getting up, you gotta be like, hey, this is the end of the film. Because if you miss this, you miss a main plot point, right? So Spider-Man, he swings Zendaya, aka MJ, through New York, and then they land. All is looking good for Spider-Man at this point, and then you see this news report come up. So Mysterio had actually recorded the final confrontation between he and Spider-Man, except using all of his special effects that no one knows, except for Spider-Man, a few of the people around him, and the Nick Fury character, but the mass public, they don't know Mysterio's true nature, right? They think that he is this superhero still to this point. But then this video comes out, clearly falsified by Mysterio and the people around him, that Spider-Man was actually the cause of a lot of this devastation. And not only that, but they announced to the world that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Now, everyone knows this. This has come full circle from when Iron Man announced himself to the world because he wanted it known but Peter Parker, he, in that sense, is kind of the opposite. He wants to be your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. And in the comics, and my cousin Joe talked about this when we did our first version of this video, but the Sinister Six is actually part of the reason why this happens in the comics. They announce Peter Parker to the world that he is Spider-Man. So I can't believe they did that to start off. The implications of that announcement to the world, they are... Great. I mean, this is one of the most drastic things to ever happen to Spider-Man in any of the movies. This is going to change everything going forward. And now everyone knows. Villains, heroes, a potential Norman Osborn, that is massive. But even though that's one of the biggest things to ever happen in a Spider-Man movie involving the character of Peter Parker... That's not what everyone's talking about in this first post credit scene because in the midst of all of this chaos and in a way tragedy, if you look at the story of Peter Parker, you have a character pop on screen. And this is the character of J. Jonah Jameson. Now, I wanted him to be in this movie before the film. Joe and I, we talked about, oh, what well, would it be crazy if J. Jonah Jameson was in this movie? Not that they would get J.K. Simmons because he was the perfect J. Jonah Jameson, but I hope they get somebody who kind of matches that intensity, right? I hope they cast someone who is close to that level, even though that's one of the greatest castings in comic book history. <laughs> and then it happens. The moment that made... My theater screamed louder than any moment in 2019 so far. And I'm talking with Avengers Endgame. Cap holds the hammer? Yeah, that was great. People screamed. Avengers Assemble? That was a massive moment, right? The theater was going crazy. But no theater or no moment had the fans screaming louder than when J.K. Simmons popped up on that screen. I don't even know what he said. I know the last few lines, just talking about Spider-Man, waving that J.K. Simmons finger, that's what I'm going to call it, uh, but I, I don't know what the dialogue was in the beginning because people 
were losing their minds, right? And if you have watched this movie, you probably should have if you're listening to this, but if you have watched this, you know what I'm talking about because I guarantee no matter where you are in the world or what theater you are in, your theater lost it when he came on screen. I mean, what a decision. That is such a nod to the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man films, but it's also just Kevin Feige saying, listen to me, I know the fans want this. I know what the fans want, and we're going to give them that. We're going to give them a great interpretation of Mysterio, and we'll talk about that here in a bit, but we're going to give them J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson, and what a decision moving forward, and that is setting up so many wonderful things for the future of the Spider-Man universe. Now, having Peter Parker go and actually take pictures for the Daily Bugle now is going to be difficult because now everyone knows that he is Spider-Man, right? So maybe it was just a nod, and maybe he's not actually going to return, but I feel like he should have a role going forward, right? It was absolutely an Easter egg in this happy moment for everyone. Like, we had Uncle Ben in the old movies. We don't have Uncle Ben now. Maybe we had J. Jonah Jameson in the old movies, but we don't have J. Jonah Jameson now. But wouldn't it be cool if he carried on his role into the future of the MCU and popped up every now and then? I don't need him to be a main player, but, guy, this is just one of the coolest moments for fans. Now, it's not a multiverse. It's not Andrew Garfield, Tobey Maguire, Tom Hardy's Venom. It's not exactly what I expected or I predicted because my predictions were going through the roof, but it was a really nice surprise. And even though I wanted a multiverse, even though I wanted to see some of these things come to fruition, oh, this could be the way they introduced the X-Men or the Fantastic Four. Now, they could still do that. Just because he made up the multiverse doesn't mean it does not exist, right? But I, I was still really happy with what we got in J. Jonah Jameson. So that's the first post credit scene. Now that's just this big thing in itself. But then you get the second post credit scene. And so we learn that the entire time, now we saw, I believe his name is Talos' character, Talos, Talos' character, at the end of Avengers Endgame when he's standing there, I guess he's the principal of Peter Parker's school. And everyone was saying, is that him? Is that really him? So you go back, you watch it. I went back and watched the movie and I kind of confirmed myself, yeah, that has to be him. That looks just like Ben Mendelsohn. So now, he pops up at the end of this movie, but he wasn't the principal. He is a scroll, so of course he can shapeshift into anyone. He was Nick Fury the entire time. And another scroll was Maria Hill. So the entire movie, we don't get Nick Fury and Maria Hill. These are scrolls doing the work of what Nick Fury and Maria Hill would be doing in the movie. So I found that fascinating. And then you find out that Nick Fury is actually on this mission in space with the scrolls. He's been on a ship the entire time. So the implications of this post credit scene, while the first one had major implications for what is happening on Earth, this one is taking the MCU in a new direction. Does this mean, and we also talked about this in my other video, Secret Wars, a massive comic book storyline where scrolls infiltrate planet Earth and start assuming the identity as Avengers. Now, we know that these scrolls right here that we're seeing on screen, they are working with the humans. So maybe they changed that storyline up and instead of working against us, the scrolls are working with us. They are infiltrating another planet because maybe a different species is thinking about invading Earth. Could this be someone that we haven't seen in the MCU so far? Now, we know they have the rights to all of the Fox characters, so could this be a Galactus situation? Could this be Silver Surfer coming to warn us? I would love to see Keanu Reeves and Silver Surfer, by the way. But there are so many possibilities of where they could go. Or even, maybe there are the scrolls that are working with the humans, and then there are the scrolls that are really pissed off, and they're coming to Earth. So maybe it's this all-out war between the superheroes, the scrolls, and then you have scrolls working with us. Guys, there are so many possibilities of where they could go with the storyline. And even though it's not going to be 100% accurate with where the comic books are coming from, nothing in the MCU really has been that so far, right? The MCU, they take a formula, they switch it up a bit, and they put it on screen. But that's what you have to do when you're adapting a book or a novel or a comic or even sometimes a true story. Not all the time. I like when true stories are very accurate. But sometimes you have to switch it up to make it cinematic. And that's what Kevin Feige is doing. These post credit scenes, guys, two of the best, and this is not just hyperbolic, this is not just something I'm saying because everyone else is saying it, right? I was going in very hesitant 
for these two scenes because I had heard that they're two of the best of all time. There's no way that this doesn't mean massive things for the MCU to come. Both of these scenes, one for Earth, one for Spider-Man's storyline, and now I am more pumped for Spider-Man 3 than I have ever been in my entire life. I think this movie could be fantastic. Whether they go the Sinister Six route, whether they go introducing maybe a Venom route with the multiverse. I don't know how they would do that because they did not set that up like we all anticipated that to in this movie, but there are so many possibilities. And then the MCU is clearly going a cosmic direction for many of the heroes. We've got Captain Marvel. We've got a potential Nova movie. We've got Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Maybe Doctor Strange 2 has something to do with space travel, guys. There are so many possibilities and opportunities to go off of what they did in that post credit scene. And I like the fact that Nick Fury is still playing a major role in this universe, even though he wasn't in the entire movie like we thought. But seeing that Ben Mendelsohn still has a role in the MCU as the major, the massive scroll, guys, these two post I know I've spent a lot of time, but wow. So now we move from what happened at the main end of the film, and let's just talk about the movie. I'm not going to say really quick, because I may spend like 5-10 minutes on it. But we start out, and Spider-Man, Peter Parker, is still dealing with the tragedy of the loss of Tony Stark. And I love how in this film, everywhere he goes, he sees Tony Stark's face. It felt like every single time they landed in a new place or they got somewhere where they weren't supposed to go until Nick Fury nudged him in that direction, he would look up and he would see a mural or a piece of art or a picture or a statue or whatever it was of Tony Stark. And even though they didn't hit on that or talk about it as much as I thought they would, Peter Parker really kind of stays quiet the entire time until that moment towards the end with Happy Hogan, which I thought was Beautiful, by the way. We saw that moment in the trailer just a tiny bit, but that entire expanded moment I thought was wonderful. It was the perfect way to kind of bring that entire situation to light and, and give Peter a moment to just sit and kind of deal with this tragedy. But you start out and you get the really kind of awkward news show-esque for the school, horribly put together PowerPoint of all of the Avengers that died in the entire Thanos situation. That was kind of ridiculous in its own right, but I think it kind of went with what they did in Spider-Man Homecoming, and it was a nice, it was a nice emotional moment, even though it was supposed to be a funny moment. My entire audience was going, oh man, like we didn't know how to feel about it, but I thought it was really funny. And then they go into explaining the blip, which is a hilarious name for the snap, and it starts explaining people returning five years later, uh, people being displaced from their homes, moving in with new families, and they use this as a joke throughout the entire movie. Now, I think this is going to frustrate some people because the snap, or the blip, was an actual tragic event. This was something that destroyed lives. It moved families around. It actually probably got other people killed. Say a pilot gets blipped and then there's a bunch of people in the airplane and then the airplane crashes. That's not very well explained. Do the people that crashed in the airplane come back when they wished them back? Probably not, but we don't necessarily know. But using this as a joke in Far From Home, I think goes with what this movie actually is because a lot of people are going to expect this to be a tragic film in the midst of the loss of a lot of these Avengers, in the midst of the snap or the blip, everyone coming back and returning. And I understand that. If that's what you wanted from this, I completely get it because it is something that is tragic in its own right. But I look at this as something that is a nice refresher after Endgame because I didn't really want another movie that's just an emotional gut punch after Endgame. I wanted something to kind of lighten the mood. And what better than a sequel to Spider-Man Homecoming, which took the John Hughes elements absolutely and just made everything kind of funny and quirky. I always say this. I, I've said this multiple times, but it felt like Ferris Bueller, The Breakfast Club, that kind of humor and those kind kind of antics, you carry that over into Far From Home, which is what the first one is, so it's very consistent, even though it's coming after this tragedy with Avengers Endgame. So I think that worked. I like that touch 
for this movie because that's what Spider-Man is. He's jokey, he's quirky, that's who this character is, and I think he's starting to accept that. Now, another thing that I can see people having problems with is the whole Iron Man Jr. concept, and it's another thing that I understand. Listen, if you want a Spider-Man who's just Spider-Man, who doesn't get all of the suits passed down to him and doesn't want anything to do with the AI or this major storyline of the glasses that we'll talk about here in just a bit, then yeah, I, I, I get it. But I like the fact that the Spider-Man is not the same as the Andrew Garfield or the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man because we don't just want another rehash. I I love the fact that they did not give us an origin for Tom Holland Spider-Man because we know the origin. How many times have we seen this, right? If Robert Pattinson's Batman comes out and we get another origin story, unless you're five years old and you've never, which you shouldn't be watching that movie anyway if you're five years old, and you've never seen a Batman movie in your life, why would you do that? So the fact that they kind of skipped over the stuff that we know and made Tony Stark the Uncle Ben figure, even though I still believe there is an Uncle Ben, but that's something that Peter Parker has clearly tried to push out of the way and gotten over. But now Tony Stark plays that role. We've seen Uncle Ben. We've seen it a thousand times. And oh, you're straying too far from the comic books. But there are so many different versions and iterations of comic books even though it's not the first version or iteration, the Peter Parker that we know and love with Uncle Ben and all of these things, I like the fact that they're doing something different. Okay, rant over. Let's get into the actual meat of the story. So we talked about the blip, how everyone is returning, how people are dealing with that. Now, it is a bit kind of, okay, none of his friends are actually significantly, okay, maybe there are a few, but the ones that we have to deal with like MJ and Ned, okay, all right, I get it, sure. Now, we get a storyline with Ned in this movie that became too much at a point, even though I thoroughly enjoyed it. Ned and Betty are, are kind of like a thing now, right? It's so funny because they're on the airplane, they get off the airplane, and it's like this span of time, they're all of a sudden madly in love. And that really is, it's kind of a teen relationship. That's how it goes nowadays. People fall in love, they don't care anymore, they break up, and that understanding at the end is like, no, we weren't really made for each other. It did provide for a funny storyline, but like I said, it did become a bit too much at times because I wanted that Ned and Peter relationship that we got in the first, even though MJ, kind of took the guy in the chair role towards the end, right? Now she knows that Peter is Spider-Man, and this is something else that I think is going to cause some frustration in the fan community, but it makes a lot of sense for me because you see it, and I went back and I watched Homecoming the other day, you see her kind of pay close attention to Peter, and you don't know why she's doing it. You don't know why she is so concerned with where Peter is and what he is doing. Yes, she has a crush on him. Clearly, and you can see that, you can feel that, and it's hard for her to open herself up. And I know people like that. My wife's kind of like that. Don't tell her I said that. I love her to death. But it's hard for her to open herself up to Peter. But you can also tell that she's kind of sensing these things happening. And yeah, Peter's in the same place that Spider-Man pops up every time that Peter goes away. It's kind of obvious. He doesn't do the best job of hiding it. And I love that they did that because at the end of the movie during the post credit scene, everyone finds out that Peter is Spider-Man. So it's not that big of a deal to me that they told MJ just a few hours or a few days prior to that. Not that big of a deal, right? So their storyline was good. Now, she is a major issue that I had in the first movie in Homecoming because I just... She came off as a bit too abrasive and too much, and every time she tried to make a quip or a joke, it didn't necessarily work for me as well as I think it wanted to. But in this movie, she is that way. In the first third, I'm like, oh, no, here we go again. Zendaya is just, she's not the right fit for this character. Or the direction for her as an actress is just not the best. But the farther we go, the more I started to buy their relationship, the more it felt like a natural teenage relationship. And by the end of the movie, I completely came around on her character. And even though she's not the MJ that everyone knows, she's not Mary Jane, but she is MJ. And I like how they're doing that. They're changing her character up. I really liked their chemistry. I really liked their relationship. It was sweet. It was awkward. And I love the awkward element to it, but it was genuinely sweet and Spider-Man of course has to protect his friends because the villain starts to learn things about them and learn that they are just loose ends that he has to take out, loose ends that he has to tie up towards the end because they now know that Mysterio is not actually the superhero that he claims to be, he is this villain that we all know and love from the comics. And now let's get into Mysterio as a villain. First up, let me wrap up some storylines that I wanted to talk about. I thought Aunt May was 
really good in this movie. I loved how she just accepted Spider-Man, Peter Parker. Those two things are one now, and she was so happy with the fact that he is out there doing what he is called to do. She even packed his suit at one point, and I thought that was really funny. Uh, I loved Flash for the most part. I thought he was funny, even though they would cut back to him every now and then, and some of the jokes wouldn't work. And that's another issue that I have with this movie. Every now and then we would have like a close-up on Spider-Man or something crazy happening or something that I was super into and then we would cut back to the teachers who were funny or the students who were also funny but every now and then, and this happens in a comedy, the joke wouldn't land I think as strong as the director wanted it to land and it would leave this small pause for the audience to laugh or clap but we wouldn't really laugh. It would just kind of hold that pause. The jokes didn't hit as hard as I think they did in Homecoming. Homecoming, I was laughing throughout. In this film, it may have been the editing or the pacing. The jokes just didn't work as well for me. And every now and then we would just cut back. I wouldn't laugh. We would cut back to what I love and I would start getting into it again. But it did slightly take me out of the moment just a personal thing. Now let's move on into Happy Hogan, who I thought was really good in this movie as well. I think Happy's relationship with Aunt May provided this through line that I didn't expect from the movie. And once again, that conversation with Peter towards the end, when they start playing back in black and Peter is sitting there working and creating his new suit, what Iron Man had laid out for him, I was like almost in tears because it was a happy moment, yes, but it was just a moment that you are filled with just pure emotion if you're a fan of the MCU, if you're a fan of this character, and if you're an Iron Man fan. They, they paid homage to Iron Man multiple times in this film. One moment was a little bit scary, but the other moments were loving and emotional, and that was the point when I looked up and I said, you know what, I, I can feel what Peter is feeling right now. All of this built up and his scene where he cries, I thought was wonderful, and it added so much, I'm, I'm like getting teary-eyed, it added so much more to this movie uh, than I ever expected. Now. Let's, let's save the best for last. Let's talk about Mysterio. Jake Gyllenhaal as this character. So he starts out, he's doing exactly what you expect him to do. He is claiming, we don't know at the time, but he's claiming to be this hero and he's getting all buddy-buddy with Peter Parker. And you can tell, even towards the end when he turns on him, you can tell he cares about Peter. He's like, he's a good kid. And I can tell he's a good kid, but I've got to do what I've got to do. So we find out that Quentin Beck actually worked, along with all of these other people, worked for Tony Stark and they're all pissed off. I mean, they are all pissed off. So Tony Stark takes this augmented reality system that we see in Civil War, turns it into barf, and just doesn't do anything with it. And then we find out that Quentin Beck was actually there at that moment. Now, of course, Jake Gyllenhaal wasn't there because they didn't know he was going to be there at that time, but it flashes back, the camera turns, and you see that all of these characters, not just him, were in or a part of integral moments in the MCU, some of them who were actually in the movies. We even get a flashback to Iron Man 1. One of the scientists looked to be the same actor that is in this film, and when they're all toasting to Mysterio, when you find out that turn after he literally just tricked Peter Parker as well as he could, and this started throwing me into, you guys remember the Spider-Man 2 game where you have to fight Mysterio, and he's creating all of these visuals, or even Batman Arkham Asylum, when you have to fight Scarecrow, when he's creating all of these illusions, this started to throw me into that, and I'm like, oh my god, this is what Mysterio should be. And that's when I think everyone in the theater realized that the first third of this movie was nice, was a good setup. I was a bit underwhelmed because I'm like, oh, we're going this direction. The back of my mind, I knew there was going to be a turn, but I didn't know it was going to be this epic and fun and entertaining and pure Mysterio. Jake Gyllenhaal is perfect. I mean, this guy comes in, he builds up this lie, and he is brilliant in his delivery, and then you see he's just in the motion capture suit. Like what Mark Ruffalo wears as the Hulk, or Josh Brolin wears as Thanos, and they take that and they put it into this world, and Mysterio is flying, but it's all just barf. It's all just this system that Tony Stark or his company helped create, and it is just the perfect way to do it. What a tie-in, what brilliant writing, and what a way to introduce Mysterio, because it's not just, oh, he's not a superhero, he's just a guy in a suit, but when you see Spider-Man actually go to confront him, and that very first scene where Spider-Man is beginning to see all of these visuals and this distorted reality that approaches him in the most lethal way possible, see, that's what I loved about the scene between he and Peter, all of the scenes, really, is he's learning about Peter. He's like, oh, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? 
And then when that happens, all of those things that Peter mentioned are starting to tie in together. He sees his girl fall. He sees this. He sees Tony Stark, a.k.a. Iron Man, climb out of the grave. What an iconic Spider-Man moment. Every moment with Mysterio as the villain in this movie is pure brilliance. It was wonderful. Some of the coolest stuff I've ever seen with Spider-Man in the live action world. And a lot of people are going to compare this to Iron Man 3 because in Iron Man 3, the Mandarin takes a turn. But in that case, in my opinion anyways, that turn is away from the comics, right? And I said this, you can stray away from the comics, but only so far before fans start to get really upset. And the Mandarin straight away, some people enjoyed it. Hardcore comic book fans of the Mandarin did not because that's not what the Mandarin was, right? So Mysterio starts out as a villain in this movie, not what Mysterio is in the comics, but that turn pushes him towards the comic book lore of Mysterio. And at the end of the day, he turns into the Mysterio that everyone wanted to see and his illusions, his magic, if you will, even though that's not necessarily magic anymore, it is brilliant. And those turns, they just kept coming. You think, oh, Spider-Man's out of this situation. No, he's back in. Oh, Spider-Man thinks he got him. Oh, no, he's back in. And Jake Gyllenhaal just kept throwing these things at him like, oh, you think you got me? You don't actually have me. And Spider-Man, who has been dealing with this Peter Tingle, is what they call in the movie, but really trying to find his Spider-Man sense because he's so messed up in the head right now after the events of Endgame and Infinity War. He's trying to hone in on his senses so he can't actually tell what's going on because he's being sucked into this reality and finding himself as in finding out what is actually real towards the end. That moment when Mysterio puts the gun on him, you don't know that there is a gun on him, but Spider-Man grabs it as he shoots was just amazing. And Spider-Man, who is a character that we have been wanting to see really cool web springing from and great action scenes. We've had some great action scenes in Infinity War and Endgame and even Civil War, but in Spider-Man Homecoming, we didn't get the best action scenes. I don't remember that movie for its action. I remember it for Michael Keaton and the moments and the dialogue and the conversation. This film, even though it's not necessarily hand-to-hand -hand combat, it holds some incredible action scenes, guys. Fighting the drones, the way he was limber, the way he was swinging. It looks like, in a weird way, kind of the CGI from the Spider-Man video games. I'm not going to praise the CGI in this movie. For the most part, it was really good, but there were some moments when I'm like, he looks a bit rubbery, but just the way Spider-Man moved throughout these scenes was pure brilliancy, and I loved the look of his fighting because he's agile. He's a spider. That's how he's supposed to fight. And those moments, guys, provided us so much as a viewer. It's what we've always wanted to see from Spider-Man and those action scenes with Mysterio when he finally realizes, here's what this is, here's what this is, and he's dodging the drones was wonderful. Mysterio is a great villain. The only issue I had with his character was towards the end, when the moment happens, Spider-Man catches the gun, he gets shot by one of the drones, and you see him get shot, and there is that moment in between where all of that stuff happens, but then Mysterio just kind of lays there and dies? Now, I didn't like how that was left completely open-ended because I want to know if we're going to see Mysterio back. Now, we saw that the entire thing was an illusion, so Mysterio is probably alive, right? Why wouldn't Spider-Man's suit pick up the fact that he wasn't dead? So... They want us to think that Mysterio is dead. If he is actually dead and that's the death that we got, because it felt a bit rushed for me. It felt like he just kind of died, it was over, and then 30 seconds later, they were back doing their thing. Now, Mysterio does pop up in that post credit scene, which adds so much more to this movie, but for me, that death felt just a tad bit rushed. It wasn't the ending I wanted to his character. Once again, we'll probably see him again. I don't think they would do Jake Gyllenhaal like that. It's kind of a disservice if he is actually dead, and Mysterio, the Sinister Six, if we get a Sinister Six, we have to get Mysterio in that film. But as of right now, Mysterio is over. He's dead as far as they want us to know, and that entire thing just wrapped up, and we get Spider-Man, who the entire movie, guys, he just wanted to live his life. He just wanted to be a kid. He's so sick of trying to be held up to Tony Stark the entire time. We barely even talked about Nick Fury. Nick Fury is just, you have to do this. You have to do that. You have to be the next Iron Man. And when Spider-Man doesn't accept that, he gives away his glasses to Quentin Beck because he truly believes that Quentin 
is the guy that's going to take the reins from Iron Man. He doesn't believe in himself. He just wants to be a kid. And for that, you can't fault him. Peter Parker has always just wanted to belong and fit in. He's wanted to belong to the Avengers. He wants to belong within his friend group. And when he hands over those glasses, that's a moment where the entire audience is saying, oh, no. And we all knew it was going to happen. We all knew that turn was coming at that moment. We didn't know how well executed it would be. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. But when he gives away those glasses, and what those glasses can do, by the way, uh, can do so much. They can bring in a weapon to take out a fellow classmate who kept trying to expose Peter Barker, by the way. The moment when he's taking all of his clothes off and that guy walks in, I, I thought that was really funny. See, moments like that really kept the humor going for me and all of those quirky moments with the class and the classmates and the teachers and all of that stuff, it worked for the most part even though I did take issue with a few things. Guys, I'm gonna keep talking because there's just so much to talk about with this movie. If I missed anything, a moment or a scene, I will definitely talk about it again later because we do have a podcast coming out on this movie. It is Pop X Cast. You guys can see right here. You can type that in on iTunes if there is still an iTunes or YouTube or anywhere you guys get podcasts. You can check that out. And I'm going to keep talking about this movie and raving about the wonderful moments because there's so many great moments, the post credit scenes, all of those things. Sorry this video was so long, but there is just a lot to talk about with this movie, guys. I truly, truly appreciate you watching this video, supporting this channel. Once again, so sorry. I lost the other spoiler review. I had to redo and talk about all of these things once again. But for you guys, it is truly and honestly worth it. You're the absolute best. Stay tuned to this channel for many more Marvel-centric videos, Netflix content, and movie reviews. And if you enjoyed this video, leave it that thumbs up. I truly appreciate that. And I'll see you guys very soon.